Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to the FW2401. Uh, this is uh, week six, and today we are talking about liquidity risk and liability risk. Now, these two parts are connected because liquidity is actually a demand for some type of liquid assets, and the source of that is the liability. So we have to manage both, and this is why those two chapters are connected. And this week, I have divided the uh, slides into five parts, uh, and also the recording will be in five parts, each maybe around 20 minutes. And uh, uh, I want you to look and uh, you know, listen or go over each part and uh, reflect on that part before you go to the uh, next part. I think that that will help you understand uh, better. And simply in the first part, we will talk about this liquidity and how does it come? To the picture, what are the sources of you know what are the causes of this liquidity, and once we know what are the causes of the of the liquidity, because the liquidity is not only the withdrawal of the depositors, it's more than that, and we will talk about it. Once we know that, we want to see where we can get sources to uh, in the balance sheet to get it. Is it, is it from the asset side, which means uh, selling our assets or from the liability side, which is make more borrowing. They just explain it more. Uh, this is the actually the first part. The second part, we'll talk about the measurement. And we have six majors. In those six majors, we will talk about the uh, we will talk about the uh, uh, the six majors. Uh, then we will have some modeling in those six majors, and we have some calculations. In part three, we'll talk about some interesting issue which is the bank run. Now, bank run represents the extreme risk of liquidity. And if it happens, 99.99 .99 of the cases of banks who goes to bank run will go bankrupt because 18% or 90% of the customers at depositor will show up in one moment or one day, you cannot uh, honor their liquidity withdrawals. And then in, within that issue of bank run, we will see the rule of the central bank uh, and the financial stability and how they can help on this issue. Uh, so the banks actually, they help in liquidity, not only in bank run, they help in liquidity, not specifically in bank run. Uh, and, and, uh, and after that, we will look at, about, we will look at liquidity in other financial institutions, because here we only talk about liquidity in banks. But we have what we call general insurance companies, we have life insurance companies, we have mutual funds, other other financial institutions, which they have their own liquidity problems and risk. And then when we finish that, uh, this is actually uh, the, the, uh, 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 the third part. Now, the fourth part, we will talk about the actually the framework of liability and when we talk about the framework of liability we'll talk about all those liability sources like current account uh, savings accounts uh, uh, long-term deposits uh, certificate of deposits uh, interbank uh, um, bond issuing bonds all around 10 times uh, i will show you uh, we will we will go over that framework and uh, Finally, also, we will go over what we call the uh, uh, risk uh, uh, risk and cost of sources of those liquidity, because we have so many types of liquidity, uh, so, so many types of liability when we finance our liquidity. And those types, some of them are cheap, but they have less withdrawal risk. And some of them more expensive, but they have uh, less withdrawal risk. So there is here, we come up, we come back to the issue of the trade-off. So, but our trade-off in this case is risk withdrawal against the cost of the source of that liability. This is the whole thing we will finish. And I think um, we will go over it in a reasonable time. Let me now go <clears throat> over part one. So uh, this is part one.
So this, uh, I think we have gone over it, but I just brought it here uh, to tell you that we almost, uh, you know, over half of the materials of this of this uh, is already done of this of this of this unit. And this time we are talking about uh, uh, liquidity risk. We have only the single loan risk, portfolio risk, and market risk. We are done with those risks. Uh, all this line is done. I will just have one chapter here and one chapter here. And actually, we are done. Now, when we talk about liquidity, in terms of the learning objective, we are satisfying learning obje the learning objective number one of this unit, which is identifying the risk of a bank. And also, we are talking about the asset and liability management of the balance sheet of the bank, which is learning objective. Uh, number three. Now, having said that, uh, let me just move to the uh, learning objective of this week. So in this week, as I said, we want to know the um, uh, liquidity and its sources. In other words, we will know the, the, the causes of liquidity. And then we want, when we want to manage it, we can sell some of our assets. And this is a new term. If we sell some of our assets, we use our stored liquidity or we can borrow, and in this case, we have another new term called purchase liquidity. Uh, but also we want to know uh, how the liquidity risk come. It comes from the asset side and liability side. So it's not only from the depositors withdrawals, we have some other sources and some other causes which we will touch on, uh, on it uh, in a minute. Uh, then we will uh, measure uh, depository institution liquidity risk and determine its liquidity need, and there's something called uh, the when we when we when we uh, uh, when we measure the what we call the uh, uh, deposit withdrawals and deposit additions, and there's something called deposit drain. Deposit drain. Now, also, we'll touch on the importance of liquidity uh, in any financial institution. It's very important to manage that one in the three institutions. Uh, as I said, we will talk about uh, what these, uh, uh, the bank run, which is the extreme uh, issue of liquidity and extreme uh, risk. And then we will see how the central bank, here we talk about uh, Reserve Bank of Australia, but it applies to central bank, how they can help in these issues. And then also our lending objective here is to know how this liquidity uh, can be crystallized in life insurance companies, general insurance and managed funds. Now, let me go to, um, this is introduction, which is liquidity actually is, is a, a fact of life for any financial institutions. We open our, if we open this business, we always receive deposits and we have withdrawals and the liquidity is part of our life and daily life in a bank. Now, the worst, as I told you, the liquidity is, um, uh, it could be the bank run. And then when it comes to the bank run, we can actually go to insolvency. Now, the uh, financial, uh, global financial crisis in 2008 uh, actually was a liquidity problem. It started when Lehman Brothers were not able to honor the withdrawals of the default swaps uh, with AIG and other you know, uh, issuers of this default swaps, and then it continues to, to the whole system. So there was actually when it started was liquidity and the system was frozen because borrowing among banks and depositors from, uh, deposit from depositors and investors was actually uh, zero um, and, and absent in those, in those you know, days around the, uh, uh, around the financial crisis. A liquidity risk may result from asset sites or liability side, and it focuses on the uh, actually the exposure of the deposit institution. Now, I already mentioned to you that the liquidity can come from the asset side. What does it mean? I want, it is a loan commitment. So, what is a loan commitment? A loan commitment is a promise to give a loan in the future, and you have to honor as a financial institution if you sign that loan that contract to give a loan in the future. It could be after one year, two years, three years, it depends on the contract. So loan commitments actually is a source of a liquidity risk coming from the asset side. Because if you give the loan, the loan will be in your asset. It will be an asset for you. Also, we have something, I don't know whether you have heard about it, which is line of credit 
to customers. Usually we give the LOC, um, so a company can apply to the bank and the bank will tell them, we will give you an LOC up to 1 million ringgit, for example, or $1 million. So I don't have to withdraw that money. But if there is an extreme stress on me as a corporation who is a customer to this bank, and my account is only say 500,000, and I issue a check for 1 million, the bank will honor that check and expense it and, and cash it as long as, because I have this line of credit. Of course, I will cover this line of credit later on, but it's like a revolving loan. I don't withdraw it. It's not an asset, but it can be any time withdrawal, depends on those corporations which you give them this line of credits. And you can give line of credits to so many corporations, that so many customers, which that may, which inflate this number. So this is asset side, but it can comes also from the. Uh, we have another issue, which is uh, this is another liquidity problem. When the interest rate goes up and you have to uh, liquidate some of your assets, like bonds, you will liquidate that one, and then due to liquidation assets uh, of those assets, uh, the price of them and the value of them because of the liquidation. Uh, and because of the liquidity need, well, you will have to sell it less than the market uh, value. And this is actually making a liquidity problem because uh, you have to sell your assets and you have to sell it under the uh, less than the market price, especially when the interest rate is going up and you are holding this type of assets. So that is the asset side. Now the liability side, we most of us know it. It's only that it's actually the depositors, um, mainly the depositors. Uh, however, the deposit institution can rely on, um, um, you know, the demand deposits. Demand deposits actually uh, are the ones that are subject to withdrawals. But we have something else called. Uh, core deposits. Now, these core deposits actually are not withdrawn. Uh, and I think I have told you about it one day. So if I have, if you have, or I have, uh, take my example, or some, any other employee, if he's receiving right, say, uh, $5,000 uh, or 5,000 ringgit in salary. Now, this 5,000 ringgit, um, you spend it, you may spend it, and part of it will not be spent. For example, maybe there will be always 500 or 1,000 ringgit in the account before the new check, the, pay, the new paycheck comes. So it will be top up, top up, and then you will continue. Now this applies to you when your money comes from your parents. Maybe you leave 50 ringgits if you receive 1,000. Um, you talk about huge corporations. You know they may receive, they may leave their uh, 15 to 20 million. So all of these amounts are actually not withdrawn. And because if they are not withdrawn, this amount is actually called core deposit. So core deposits, it's part of the deposit that are not withdrawn and stays in the bank for long time. Okay, let's go to the next. Uh, this is just the sources of light. Uh, the asset side and liability side. How can we deal with it? We can purchase. Purchase means borrow. Borrow from where? You can borrow from, um, uh, from uh, competitor banks, interbank market, and the other institution investors. Um, um, this is actually, you manage the liability side. When you, do, when you borrow, you manage the liability side. Um, that will preserve the asset side of the balance sheet. If you only deal, which means you don't have to sell your assets, you will deal only with the liability side when you have uh, any liquidity needs. Now, borrowed funds are likely to be higher rates than interest paid on deposits. That funds is to be borrowed at market rates, which means uh, if you borrow from the central bank or you borrow from interbank market, actually it's not like the amount you pay to your depositors but it will be according to the market rate. Now, purchase liquidity management allows the institution 
to increase the all, overall balance sheet. And I want to show you this, how it happens. Because when you have a liquidity problem and you finance it from liability, the size of the balance sheet will increase. Now let's talk about the sub liquidity. This is just selling my assets, which is liquidating my assets. In absence of reserve requirements, banks tend to hold access reserve assets that is more than 6% of the total assets are he which held in cash. So we are talking about securities, like government securities. All of those is a very, very short term securities which you can sell anytime and it becomes like a cash. So we call it a cash assets. It's not cash, but cash assets where you can sell it you know, very fast. And this is a very short term, like the government securities um, and you can raise cash uh, and solve liquidity. Uh, downside of access cash is um, um, you can have too much here uh, of, of cash and you know um, cash assets like securities, but of course you will miss the uh, you know investing in long term assets that will give you higher return because those cash and cash assets uh, they get very very. Um, you know, uh, low uh, returns. Now, uh, decreases size, and, and this will decrease the size of the balance sheet because this, uh, when you when you sell some of your assets, the size of the assets will decrease, and because you sell it, for example, to pay for depositors, so the depositors will decrease in the liability side. The assets will decrease in the asset side, and then the size of the balance sheet, of course, will decrease. Now, this is maybe uh, a mind map. Uh, this is what I want you to understand. This is what happened every day in the bank. We have something called net deposit drain. Now, the net deposit drain is actually the deposit withdrawals minus the deposit additions. And this is actually in every day. Every day you can calculate how much is the net deposit drain. Now, um, uh, if you, uh, there is a risk of not having sufficient funds to meet payments uh, because you need to meet the unexpected changes in customer withdrawals. This is the liability side. And if you don't have enough cash, there is a problem. Or you can actually honor this, what we call loan uh, drawdowns. The loan drawdowns, is actually related to the loan commitments. And we call it the asset side. So just to summarize, summarize this is the source of liquidity, uh, which is, um, it can be very risky if you rely on demand deposits and deposits uh, raised through other transaction account, mostly at call deposits. We have so many types of demand deposits, not only the uh, current accounts and uh, not only the the tail deposits, we have so many of them, and this have actually a high risk of withdrawals. Um, and what would happen when you have a liquidity? You will have to do two things. Either you sell your assets, and sometimes when you sell your assets, you sell them in rush, in rush, and you have to raise the funds. And usually when you do that, and the market is not liquid, you go to one point, to one issue called fire sale. Now, fire sale, let me identify it here. Fire sale is a sale of an asset that is less than the market price. So you sell your assets because you are rushing and you are under this stressful liquidity, but you sell it fire sale. You sell your asset under the market, lower than the market price. You sell your asset lower than the market price. Now, if you decide to actually use purchased liquidity and you want to borrow and you are rushing under this stress of liquidity, usually you will have high cost of funds, which means you will borrow more than the market. So the first problem, you sell your asset less than the market. And when you borrow, you borrow more than the market. So how to address liquidity? We said from the sort liquidity, or purchase liquidity. Store liquidity like the cash, treasury securities, certificate of deposits, those assets in the asset side, you sell them. 
or versus liquidity interbank market or repos. Repos is repos, which is repurchase agreement. Repurchase agreement. This is usually between you and the central bank. You sell them and you buy them later. You sell them now cheap and you buy them later with higher price. And the difference is actually your cost of this borrowing. Interbank market, they will give you according to the market rate. Okay, um, now let me go to, I think we are done with the same issue. I just want to now to tell you now, what would happen to my balance sheet when I finance through British liquidity or as uh, stored liquidity? You already know, stored liquidity means selling my assets. Uh, British liquidity means borrowing. I want to see whether I have a liquidity uh, demand or liquidity risk coming from the asset side, which is a loan commitment, or from the liability sides, which is the depositors withdrawals. And in each type, I will address it through two types, either through purchase liquidity or through stored liquidity. So now we have four scenarios. You have stored liquidity, you have uh, a liability problems coming from the asset side, and you address it through the purchase liquidity or stored liquidity. This is two cases. Or a case of purchase li uh, of, uh, um, you know, a liquidity risk coming from the liability side, which is a withdrawal of depositors. You address it also from the asset side, which is the stored liquidity, or from the liability side called the purchase liquidity. So we have two cases here and two cases here four cases, we will see how the balance sheet, uh, uh, what, what will be the impact on the size of the balance sheet, which is the total assets and total, and total liabilities. Now, assume hypothetical DI, deposit institution, normally holds 9% of its asset in cash. So this is 9%. As depositors withdrawal, 5 million in deposits, the deposit institution can meet this directly by running down the cash held in its treasuries, down the cash held in its treasuries, or by withdrawing balance on deposits at other banks or borrowing. Now, this is a 5 million. If the reduction in 5 million in deposit liabilities is mainly 5 million reduction in cash assets. When I say cash assets, mainly I mean securities held by financial deposit institutions. Now, its balance sheet would be shown in the following and banal B, which I will show it now. We will deal with this issue when it is from borrowing, and we will deal with it when it is from the asset side. Now, let's look at this. Uh, this is simply the withdrawal is here. This, is, this area is the balance sheet before the withdrawal. So we have a liability of 5 million, which means my liability now here will be 65. So this is the balance sheet after the withdrawal, which is a normal thing. It is just dropped from 70 to 65. Now, what, what about my assets? I finance it through stored liquidity. So I have 91, which is other assets, the securities. I didn't touch the cash because this bank usually held cash of 9%. So I have 100 million of total assets, 9% is 9 million. So they are not touching this area. So they are selling the securities. They are selling part of the securities. How much they will sell? They will sell five, the withdrawal. So this will be 86. This is the whole thing. Let's check what is the impact on the balance sheet. The balance sheet will decrease, why? I used to have 100, now it's 95. So the first rule is when we have a liability, when we have a, a, li a liquidity risk coming from the liability side, like withdrawals, and we deal with it from stored liquidity, which is the asset side, the balance sheet size will drop. So liability side risk, financed or, uh, you know, uh, uh, addressed through the asset side, the balance sheet size will drop. Let's look at the next case. 
Now, this is the next case. The, uh, we have uh, addressing liquidity risk from the liability side, which means now I have this 70, and this 70 is actually um, uh, was dropped to 65 withdrawals. I, did the, I don't touch the asset side, I keep it as it is. I go and touch the liability side, which means I go and withdraw. So I used to have, um, uh, I, uh, the borrowed fund now is becoming, it was 10, now it becomes 15 because I borrowed five. So if you look at this case, which is case two, if you have a liability side, if you have a risk of, uh, if you have a liquidity risk coming from the liability side, and they finance it from the liability side, which is the purchase liquidity, there will be no change on the size of the balance sheets. So this is 100, it stays 100, nothing. I just get rid of one borrower and bring another borrower. It's as simple as this. Now let's talk about the asset side. Now we talked about the liability side. Let's talk about the asset side. The asset side, we have this balance sheet of all star bank. This is the balance sheet before everything. But now we have a problem. The liquidity is not coming from the asset side. It's actually coming from the, uh, it doesn't come from the liability side. It comes from the asset side. And let me remind you how it can come from the asset side, either three loan commitment or what we call LOC, line of credits. Now, this is actually coming through loan commitment. Let's see how it happens. So, All Star Bank, largest customer, decided to exercise 15 million loan commitment, which means the asset side now will increase by 15. How I'm going to finance this one? I can finance it from the asset side or I can finance it from the liability side. What will happen if I finance it from the asset side? So, there will be no change because the loans was 105, 105, it becomes now 120. And my securities used to be 50. Now I sell some of them and I paid to this loan, which is, I drop it by 15, 35. What is the um, uh, impact on the balance sheet? Nothing, it's still 70. So the third case, when we have uh, a liquidity risk coming from the asset side, and you finance it through the uh, asset side, there will be no change. So just you get out of some um, assets called cash and bring some assets called loan. Uh, so what would happen if we finance it through the liability side? If you finance it through the liability side, <clears throat> sorry, the asset, the um, balance sheet will increase. So don't touch the asset side. I go and borrow. So somebody come and wants 15 um, million of, of loan. So I can now go and borrow 15. So my liabilities increased from 40 to 55 and my assets increased from 105 to 120. So the asset side, the balance sheet is increased. So the fourth rule, if we finance through the uh, if we, if we have a uh, liquidity risk coming from the asset side and we finance it through liability, the balance sheet size will increase. So this is the four cases and I'm done with part one. Thank you very much. And I will see you in the second part. Bye-bye.